This is it, the moment I've all been waiting for. The $100 million internal combustion efficiency challenge. I'm going to throw it out there to you, and if you win, the car industry can pay you, so that's nice. All the facts you need coming up to engineer the big bucks. And even if you're not the lucky winner, you will discover definitively why internal combustion engines are so damn inefficient and exactly where all of that energy is lost. Uh, bear with me. Look, I'm not going to lie to you, okay? This is going to be scary complex, and I'm very pleased that you've decided to take the red pill with me today and jump down the rabbit hole of beer garden, physicist, understanding of efficiency, whatever. But I fear we may not all make it back out of this alive. So do me two favours, okay? Number one, put on some pants. And number two, clear your internet browsing history right now, just in case. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. The elusive 100 million big ones. This is not a joke. It's just minutes away. It's simple, but face facts, it's not going to be easy. So brace for impact, beer garden propeller heads. Efficiency starts off dead easy but it quickly spirals right out of control. Like most things in science, okay, efficiency is very easy to understand at a basic level. It's a simple percentage calculation. And all you do is you measure the rotational kinetic energy at the crankshaft and you divide that by the total amount of energy that is available in the fuel. So just to do a really basic example that you can relate to, let's just assume I've got five litres of nature's finest organically grown hydrocarbons just here. And I think you'd agree, organic is best. So five litres at about 34 and a bit million joules per litre. That's, let's ballpark it and make this easy, 180 million joules of combustion energy potentially locked up in the fuel, let's say. If your crankshaft is then delivering 60 million joules of rotational kinetic energy out of this five litres of gasoline, then your engine is doing pretty well because it is 33% efficient. And of course, you can look at the car overall, in which case, instead of the crankshaft, you would look at the wheels and see how much energy there is there. And typically, cars lose about 15% more energy between the crankshaft and the wheels, so you'd have to take that off, and then the car efficiency would be less than the engine efficiency, obviously. But as soon as you jump into the rabbit hole properly and you figure out how deep it really goes, efficiency calculations get horrendously complex. Here's an example. So I'm gonna try and insulate you from that Nobody deserves that, after all. So basically, there's this <laughs> cock of a design flaw in the universe. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. The second law gives rise to this inconvenient thing called entropy, which sounds somewhat pleasant, you know? We overnighted at our villa in Entropy Faux Pas in the south of France. <laughs> it sounds pleasant until some friggin' lecturer informs you that entropy is actually Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38, times 10 to the minus 23 metres squared per kilo per second squared per degree Kelvin. <laughs> I know. Pants on. Check. Multiplied by the natural log, like the Naperian logarithm of a system's multiplicity. Yes. And dumbing this down quite a bit, entropy is essentially just the amount of energy you have to pump into a system to stop it from becoming completely chaotic and disorganized. Entropy is just like the matrix. It's all around you and all around me, 24-7, 365, and most of humanity just doesn't see it. And yet, if you're anything like me, you are locked in this battle against this pervasive enemy, 
every weekend. You mow the lawn, you repair this and that, you paint the house, you get out the mighty power tools and you You pump down range, copious rounds, enthusiastically, with one aim in mind, and that would be to get Entropy's dick in the dirt. And it never works, because Entropy is pervasive, and it ultimately will win. It is why we age, and it is why the clock ultimately will stop for you, and it will certainly stop for me. So there's a cheery thought. And I'm not saying that this is like entropy we're like engaged in a battle with entropy or something we are engaged in a battle with entropy each of us every day it is that pervasive so irreversible processes like combustion are essentially entropy's wet dream the irreversibility of the combustion process effectively loses you about 25 percent of all of the fuel's potentially available energy and i know this is hard to conceptualize but i assure you it's very real and there's nothing you can do about it it's the same with burning coal for electricity. Entropy is the fundamental speed limit on efficiency when any process like combustion is not reversible. Everyone who paid attention at university agrees that there is no hack for the second law. It is everywhere and you cannot turn it around. It's why those anti-aging creams on TV that they advertise incessantly are such bullshit. Entropy is why we age. It's why cars need servicing. It's a weird concept, perhaps, because it's been hidden around you in plain sight for your entire life, and it was there for all of time before that. So, the maximum possible engine efficiency is about 75%, and some of those huge container ship engines get about 60%. So, that's not too bad, you know, 60 out of 75 is a pass. Bigger is generally better in the domain of machine efficiency, and it's why trucks went from just plain old semis to B-doubles for the long haul. Just remember, we're talking about thermal efficiency here, thermodynamic efficiency, which is a completely different animal to fuel efficiency, and it's so easy to be semantically promiscuous here if you're not at the top of your game. See, thermal efficiency is all energy in the fuel versus recoverable kinetic energy from the crank, whereas fuel efficiency usually means fuel economy, which is dependent upon a whole range of additional factors. So modern petrol, which is gasoline in America, petrol engines are about 35% efficient ballpark, and modern diesels are maybe early 40s. That is all at about peak thermal efficiency, which is like peak torque production, if you like. In normal driving conditions on the road, which would be moderate loads and something like 2,000 RPM, maybe a little less on the taco, they tend to be less thermodynamically efficient than that. Modern diesels have higher compression, so they are more efficient engines than their petrol counterparts. Petrols can't tolerate the higher compression because they're knock limited. And this is because the compression ignition thing in a diesel is less about the propagation of a flame front and more about sort of quasi spontaneity. I know, <laughs> pants on. It's easier to understand efficiency using the first law of thermodynamics, which is the one that's all about the conservation of energy. You can do a whole losses breakdown using the second law too, but I fear the casualties we suffer will really mount up if we try to do that now. Now look, Let's talk honestly and frankly, okay? I know at least one of you has not yet cleared that critical browsing history. Just put yourself in the position of others who have to pick up the pieces, right? What is your widow going to think when she arrives at the mortuary and she has to stare down at the confronting reality of your cadaver, which is not wearing pants? And then she goes home and she discovers all of those abhorrent downloads from nunswithbigcans.com. There is still time to prevent this needless suffering. 
if you act now. Okay, so the dead set propeller head geniuses at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee did a breakdown on exactly the distribution of those energy losses, and they used a 1.9 litre GM diesel engine. This was back in 2011, and they are acknowledged world-class brainiacs at this stuff. They did a second law of thermodynamics breakdown as well. Link in the description. Pro tip, wear the brown pants to review that. Hashtag Deadpool. At normal road-going loads, okay, out of 100% of the energy in the fuel, only about 26% gets to the crank, and the rest is just lost, frittered away, and that does not sound good. Three quarters just blown. We burn about 30 billion litres with a B of petrol and diesel, right? The combined total is about 30 billion here in Shitsville every year. And this means that more than 20 billion of that volume just gets burned without serving a productive purpose. It does not move anything. Therefore, efficiency is perhaps the most important negative issue for the global dynamics of the human race, right? Certainly more people should think about it than currently are on the case. I'm gonna simplify Oak Ridge's findings just a little bit, but here's where they found out all of that energy actually goes. So if you take nothing else away from this report, let it be this diagram, because this is your roadmap of energy conservation opportunity. The dudes at Oak Ridge were very specific and they went into great detail about this. I've simplified it quite a bit for the domain of beer garden physics and I just want to ballpark the numbers a little bit as well without getting bogged down in the specific percentages because they will change from engine to engine and from operating condition to operating condition. The salient thing to remember is that only a quarter of the energy in the fuel is actually doing productive work at the crankshaft. So 75% of this energy is your opportunity for the big bucks. And the biggest loss category here is heat loss through the engine. Q is the standard physics type symbol for heat. I don't know why. Anyway, about a third of that energy is just heat loss through the engine, mainly departing through the radiator. So if you can figure out something to do with just some of that heat and get some of that energy back, you are well on your way to a solution. The other big heat loss category just here, the exhaust, that is about one part in five. Let's call it 20% of the heat being lost up the bum of the exhaust pipe, which is of course why turbochargers were invented. And the final loss category here, about the same, let's call it another 20%-ish, or one part in six if you want to be closer in terms of the energy budget, is pumping losses and friction. And they split up like this, about 6% for the pumping losses and about 11 for the friction. So about one third and two thirds of this slice of the pie, which we might call mechanical losses in the engine. Friction's easy to understand. It's anything that drags against the rotation of the crankshaft, which would be friction in the bearings, friction in the bores, all of that kind of thing. Friction in the belts of any necessary accessories that you are driving at the pointy end of the engine. Pumping, I think, is a little bit harder for many people to conceptualise because engines and pumps share many of the same characteristics, and yet engines are not pumps. In fact, they are philosophically the opposite of pumps. See, pumps actually use a source of motive power, like, let's say, an electrical motor, to do work on a fluid, let's say, water, and pump it uphill whereas an engine does exactly the opposite. The fluid does the work by burning inside the engine, and that produces motive power. So it is philosophically the opposite. The unfortunate thing about engines is that they incur pumping losses. And pumping losses are like this, okay? You have to compress the fuel air charge as part of the four-stroke cycle, because if you don't, it's much harder to extract mechanical work, and the size of the engine required blows out of all proportion. So those pumping aspects of the job, compressing the charge and sucking in the inlet charge and pumping out the exhaust charge, 
there are minor losses, 6% of the total, that go with those kinds of operations when the engine is forced to endure the indignity of acting as if it is a pump to get the job done, even though it would rather not do any pumping whatsoever. So there you go. There's your roadmap of opportunity. The big opportunities are all to do with heat loss, which is 20% and 33%, call it 55% of the total. If you can just figure out something to do with that heat, you will be literally in the money. And if you can tackle the thorny issue of pumping losses too, then hey, you're a proper brainiac and probably not worthy of a seat at the beer garden physics table because you'd be too good for that. So here's the basic problem, okay? We're all on the same page now. We can all see and understand exactly where those energy losses occur. The real problem is the immense practical barriers actually to reducing them, right? The engine loses slightly more energy essentially through the radiator than it delivers to the crankshaft for your forward progress and motive power enjoyment. And this heat energy out of the radiator is just totally thrown away. You don't get to use it ever again. So I guess, hypothetically, we could eliminate the cooling system and retain all of that heat. And one thing is certain, that's going to push the piston down a lot harder because the gases would be hotter and thus there would be more energetic expansion within the cylinder, which is exactly what we want. Thermal efficiency in that case would skyrocket, but only for about 60 seconds, because then the elevated operating temperature within the engine would melt sundry vital components, like pistons and valves, and it would destroy your engine, inconveniently. This heat rejection through the radiator of your car, right, this massive loss of energy, it's a necessary evil. So I guess, hypothetically, we could make engines from super tolerant unobtainium which doesn't exist, inconveniently, and if it did, it's a safe old bet that we wouldn't be able to afford it in any case. So there's that. What a pity that Stark Industries' vibranium does not actually exist. Next, okay, we're losing quite a lot of energy out of the exhaust manifold too, right? Rapidly expanding kinetically energetic gas is just being ejected. You can drive a turbocharger with that. In fact, the engine that was tested by Oak Ridge was turbocharged. So the efficiency increase from turbocharging, which is recovering some of that waste heat, is represented in those numbers already. Turbos are in fact an excellent way to repurpose the energy that would otherwise be lost out of the exhaust pipe, and the, some of it at least, and this is of course why there have never been more turbocharged cars on the market, because efficiency is increasingly a big deal in the industry. I guess you could also open the exhaust valve several degrees of crank rotation later in the cycle, and that would give those energetic exhaust gases more time to work on the piston. So that's good. But if you do that, okay, it's going to reduce a thing called scavenging, which helps the inlet flow charge for the next power stroke. And the engine would then incur additional pumping losses getting that job done, which is bad. And this is actually the way of many an efficiency hack hypothesis, okay? Just so you're aware if you're dreaming up your own now as we speak or later on. The benefit of the proposed tweak, which you can see clearly, is often eroded or negated by some feedback effect of actually doing the tweak. You gain over here, but you lose over there. People get heat and temperature so emphatically confused, all right? Now, there's plenty of waste heat with an engine, but one of the problems is that a lot of it is not occurring at a sufficiently high temperature relative to the ambient environment actually to do anything worthwhile with. And back in the 1970s, NASA, no less than NASA, attempted to tackle this thorny problem with this report. And uh, I don't know if you can see that properly, but we'll have a crack to shield it just a bit for you there. It's called Emissions and Total Energy Consumption of a Multi-Cylinder Piston Engine Running on Gasoline and a Hydrogen-Gasoline Mixture. So what the brainiacs at NASA actually did in this report was they built a thing called a methanol steam 
reformer that is powered by exhaust waste heat and its function was to produce hydrogen gas which was fed back into the engine to see whether or not there was a net thermodynamic improvement. Now there's a couple of problems with this methanol steam reforming process. I'll just detail them for you, okay? Just the catalyst, the chamber for the catalyst required to do this job. And NASA made no real attempt to optimize the design and make it compact. But it was eight inches in diameter and two feet long. Okay, so that's pretty big in the concept of just one part of this device that needs to be fitted in the engine bay. It's full of copper and manganese too, and it weighs 18 kilograms, which is about 40 pounds. So the, the whole installation here is, you're not gonna get much change out of about 40 kilos for your methanol steam reformer. You also need a tank of distilled water in the engine bay and some methanol. And the gas that you are producing is, it's actually a mixture of superheated methanol and steam together with carbon monoxide and some hydrogen and some methane gas. Now, carbon monoxide is a deadly poison and if that gets out, it's gonna kill you. So you wouldn't want to do this in the backyard, I think you'd agree, or even here with me in the beer garden. I would not feel comfortable giving you instructions to do that. Now. You gotta remember that they did this in 1977 with available engine technology. They used one of those 7.4 litre, so what's that, uh, 472 cubic inch Chevy big block V8s with a carburetor. Remember those. That was the available technology at the time. And they did all of these experiments with this gas mixture and what they essentially found was that it was kind of impractical and there was a huge increase in oxides of nitrogen in the exhaust because the inlet gases had to remain sufficiently hot to keep the water and methanol superheated in the mixture on the way into the engine and stop them condensing out in the inlet manifold. So I think it's fair to say that there were a vast number of technical problems, although overall it was an interesting exercise at recovering some of the waste heat and using it to drive this methanol reforming device that they built for, uh, you couldn't even call it a prototype, it was just a lab rat type experiment. And in the intervening let's call it 42 years, okay, 42 years. They've had the opportunity to take these findings in every one of the major car companies on earth and optimize the shit out of NASA's work. So what's happened in the intervening time, right? This information has been in the public domain. There's been four decades for the car industry to get on top of it. And what have we seen? Well, we've seen engines come down in size. We've seen vast improvements in efficiency. We've seen lots of turbocharging. We've seen carburetors become obsolete, replaced with, at first, multi-point fuel injection and, secondly, by direct injection. But I don't know about you, I have not seen a single vehicle with an inbuilt methanol reformer powered by the exhaust gas. So I think you'd have to say that not even NASA could make the waste heat in the exhaust of a hugely inefficient engine actually do anything productive. So this is a significant challenge for you. The third super significant loss category is pumping friction and driving the engine's accessories like the water pump and the oil pump. Almost 20% of the total energy in the fuel is lost doing that, and that is very significant. So reducing internal friction is a big deal for car makers. But if you're doing that, and that's your job, and you get too enthusiastic, engines are going to start to misbehave. And by misbehave, I mean they're gonna burn a lot of oil or they're gonna to start to wear out prematurely, and then there is a reputationally damaging customer backlash. Plenty of car makers have had recent oil consumption backlashes. It may have impacted you. It's because of engineering over enthusiasm reducing that friction. A lot of work's already been done on these parasitic losses too. And this is why most cars today have electric power steering. 
because it eliminates the need to drive a hydraulic pump continuously off the crankshaft. The electric servo assistance only operates when you actually need steering assistance and when you don't, it saves a hell of a lot of parasitically lost energy. But even you know, when these kinds of losses are tackled by super competent R&D propeller heads who do this like an extreme sport, the cam lobes in your engine still need to be turned against the return springs. The oil pump still needs to battle viscous resistance and the pistons still need to compress the inlet air charge, etc. Just for completeness, let's talk about one final vector for energy loss inside your internal combustion engine. And I will draw it in approximately to scale for you right now. Can you guess what that line represents? It's unburned hydrocarbons. In other words, the fuel that passes through your engine and is not burned before it gets to the exhaust. Now, Oak Ridge found that 1.8% was the proportion of the fuel that was not burned at normal road-going loads and speeds in that 1.9 litre General Motors engine. That's very little, okay? So take that fact with you everywhere and use it for reference because any of those assholes who try to sell you a miracle fuel saver that targets the thorny problem of unburned hydrocarbons the maximum saving it can deliver is something like 2%. And that's if you're really lucky. And we know why the 2% is in there. It's because if you decide to go 100% Volkswagen and lean the mixture right out and burn all of the fuel that goes in in an excess of air, then the unburned hydrocarbons will be eliminated. But the problem then will be a huge spike in the production of oxides of nitrogen, which is exactly what the Dieselgate scandal is about. And we know that oxides of nitrogen are very bad components to have in exhaust because they're toxic. They're bad for human health off the bat. When they get into the air, they decompose and they are a primary vector for things like acid rain and also the formation of carcinogenic particles secondarily in the atmosphere. So for all of these reasons, it's not a bad idea to have a small amount of unburned hydrocarbons in the fuel that can be treated in the catalytic converter and also that rein in the production of oxides of nitrogen. So I'd suggest that if your $100 million challenge efforts are focused at remediating the unburned hydrocarbons in the exhaust, then you are barking up preposterously the wrong tree. My hundred million dollar challenge to you, my trouser wearing, sanitized, browsing history surviving friend, is if you can make just a 5% improvement to internal combustion engine thermal efficiency, you are going to be set for life. Car makers will queue up over the horizon to pay you that eight-figure sum. But before knocking on their door to tell them of your miraculous discovery, I'd suggest you go and have a look at Mazda's HCCI engine, the Homogenous Charge Compression Ignition Gasoline Engine. It's ultra lean, it's not knock limited, it's got super high compression, but it is quite complex though. It's proper rocket science, I think you'd agree. And engineering tends to follow the path of least resistance. If there is some simpler solution, they're generally going to run with that, right? Because it's cheaper and thus easier to implement. You now know exactly what you must do, right? You've got to target a few specific things. You've got to do something smart with the waste heat, smarter than NASA. You've got to design a magic new material that does not need a cooling system <laughs> Unfortunately, the pro tip there, there are no new elements left to find. They've all been discovered. You've got to eliminate frictional losses or eliminate inlet and exhaust valves because driving them is a bit of a bastard for efficiency. And philosophically, that is how you make more cash than you can ever spend for the rest of your life. I dare you to do this, therefore. I double dead dingoes, dried donger, dare you, so you know it's... Pretty serious dare, right? Hashtag Australia. If your efficiency hack actually works, the major car makers will be bitch slapping you with $100 bills and what a way to go. I am not smart enough to hack this myself as a solution, right? But perhaps you are. Best of luck and 
do let me know how you go. Pro tip though, the answer is not magnets on the fuel line, it's not a whirly bird thingo in the inlet plumbing, it's not a fuel catalyst, and it's certainly not a friggin' under bonnet water electrolyzer. And sadly, it's not even a Peter Brock energy polarizer. Remember those. Very sad to say, particularly with that last one, if only it were that simple. But then where would the challenge be? Good luck, and if you get the 100 million big ones, do cut me in.